right hello now let's go discord and right so um if people can join me on the discord channel um uh, they can be they can talk to me um because it's nice to have class interaction. Uh, it also allows you guys to hear and chat and, and discuss things in the Discord channel while I'm talking um, in the, uh, um, during the lecture, you can also write questions. Uh, it's quite nice when I'm this far away and I can't see you, it's nice to be able to see some interactions happening in the, the Discord chat. You can thumbs things up, I can, Put questions well, in there. Aha, Christopher, now you're there. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Ten o'clock at night. It is also evening. Right. So you can see me on the screen. Have you put me YouTube up on the big screen? Now with a uh, certain delay, we see you on the screen, right? Yep. So I think everyone agrees on that, so it's, that's pretty good. That's now, good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. you probably want to take the audio on Discord off if you're, um, because I can I can hear it coming back through there. Uh, that's not a good idea. Right, hang on. So we only follow you on Skype, uh, on, on YouTube. Yeah, I mean, well, um, as as students, they can they can jump on the the um, Discord channel if they keep their mics down. But I think because you're also playing the YouTube, it then sends the audio to me, so I get that you know myself repeated a wee bit later. But you can certainly type in the Discord, so so all of the students who are able to type if they can join the Discord. Uh, Discord. I just sent out the the invite to the room um, in the. Uh, email announcements so people can join me there um, but you know um, I, you can also thumbs me up and if you want to talk to me just click on there and, and start chatting at me um, uh, you can interrupt me basically by yelling at me on the discord um, okay is my audio too loud or is it about right so I can get a thumbs up in the discord for audio is audio okay Someone should be able to thumbs that up. Aha, yep, yay. <laughs> Someone responded, that's great. Um, about right, okay, that's good. Okay, so um, if I scoot over to the presentation, I have three little guests watching me um, and myself, excellent. So um, if you want to, you should also be able to follow the slides in higher resolution in Prezi and as I move through them, it'll update that on your screen as well. So, so we've got kind of you've got multiple ways of, of seeing the um, the material. Okay, so we've been looking at, at, at you've been looking at serious games, and, and you've already had an introduction. Um, I don't know how much of this Christopher's already gone through with you, so um, I might need him to tell me to move more quickly um, through material if I'm repeating stuff that you've already heard. So, but I'll, um, I've got kind of two parts. This is partly my take on serious games as well as a discussion on specifically games for health. Um, so are you happy with me talking about my general um, background in um, serious games as well as games for health? Oh, I'm getting a input back. Right, pretty much covered the foundation sessions, um, but not the health specific stuff. Okay, so uh, I will very really quickly step through some of these, right? So um, I know I, I had more material here than I po could possibly get through. So it's, it's um, so a little overview is, is going to be fine to give you, to, to give you a background of, of where, where my thinking comes from and, and then apply that to specifically games for health. Um, yep, okay, so. When we look at games, I think of games as being play plus rules, 
right? So just a very simple dish definition. You can get much more complex and then you have to start looking at, at what features are necessary and what features combined are sufficient to make something a game. Uh, one of the things you'll often find in academic writing um, is that people's definition of game, so they'll, they'll try and define what they mean by a serious game or what they mean by a game. Um, I often find that they confuse good games with games, right? So some of their definitions are definitional in, in the sense of they define what something is, but some of their the the parts of their definition actually describe what a good version of the thing is, right? So you can imagine they often use fun. A game has to be fun. The answer is, well, maybe a good game has to be fun, but you could have something that was a game that wasn't very fun, right? Because fun's subjective and fun is for certain people in certain places. And so when we talk about serious games and we talk about health, there's a lot of things about health which aren't fun. And some things that, that aren't actually particularly good games either. They're still a game. It's a, it's a health game. It's just not a good health game, right? Either not good because it's not fun or it's not effective, right? So, so having a, a simpler definition of game, which is more inclusive, means that when, you kind of, when you're starting to talk about the artifacts that you're discussing in your research, you're not kind of just stuck with the, oh, is it a game or not? Well, let's call it a game and then move from there. So I generally give a, a more broad definition. Gamification, um, using game mechanisms to enhance user experience. So um, there are lots of interesting definitions of gamification. I've seen recently a discussion at one of gamif like gamif conf gamification conferences saying, oh, we've screwed up. We've destroyed the usefulness of gamification because we overhyped it and now it's all shit and nobody's getting any good results and everybody hates us we need to come up with a new term so we can sell them our old marketing material um just under a new bit of jargon um so basically the gamification bit of jargon is going to disappear as the marketers look for a new word where they can sell all the stuff they've been doing for the last 30 years under a new name now that's not what i considered gamification um I was doing gamification and, and I think of the Olympic Games as gamification. But um, yeah, so it's, it, I, I, I think gamification does have a really interesting place in design of engaging experiences. Um, but unfortunately at the moment we've still got a bunch of marketers who are, who are selling their stuff using our term. But that's going to go away soon, hopefully. Um, so if you think of the, the, the current kind of examples of, of um, games for health, things like RunKeeper, um, this is a game vocation of going for a run. Um, what's really interesting, and, and you can see I'm, I'm wearing a Fitbit Versa, um, if you can see, you know, I've got that, and, and I'm currently at 10,661 steps today. Um, and you know, it gives me the little buzz when I get to 10,000 steps. This is a gamification because it has rewards and it has feedback and it has challenges and and I'm currently our department at Victoria University is doing a can we walk from one end of the country to the other by combining all our steps and so for three weeks we're reading all of this and then we're putting it in and little little challenges and little status things so they're trying to gamify exercise now one of the interesting things is when you do that to exercise and I've seen this with my wife, is that if you take the watch off, if you take your, your pedometer off, sometimes you'll be, uh, there's no point in going for a walk because it won't be recorded. Right? Because what you're doing is done is you've turned walking into something that is part of a game. And when the game goes away, you can't be bothered walking because it's no longer fun on its own for its own sake. It is now fun because the watch tells you it's fun, because the game tells you it's fun. And RunKeeper has the same kind of thing. As you, you, you run, once you turn running into a game, if the game goes down or you can't access it, you suddenly feel like, well, what's, what's the point? Right? And that's, that's something we're gonna come back to fairly regularly when discussing serious games, and particularly games for health, where if you're trying 
to have a long-term effect, then you don't want to have this, this spike in engagement followed by a dip below where you were when you first started, right? So, so you've got to kind of avoid those yo-yo exercising kind of regimes. So <clears throat> gamification, I also talk about degrees. I, I gamify a lot of things. Some of you have um, had, had seen my undergraduate stuff where I do weird things with, with exams. Um, there are some people who tried to turn um, their courses into experience gaining things where you did quests and you gain experience and you start off with zero experience. So everyone's getting an F at the start of the course and then you gain experience points to increase your grade through the, through the semester. Um, until you become, you know, you get enough experience points and you get an A. Um, so, so yeah, I, some of those are very gimmicky and um, they've been replicate, tried to be replicated in other places and some of them just don't work if you don't have the right culture and the right people involved in, in teaching the course. So gamification is, is somewhat fragile. Okay, so if we have a look at, at mechanisms, Right, so have you been through these game mechanics, Christopher? I assume you have, but I'll just repeat them myself. Um, but if you've been through them, I can go a wee bit faster. Um, so there are, um, I was looking at, at um, Noel Felstein's list recently, and he has like 150 of these. Um, so so the, these are not the exhaustive list. These are just some of the, the things that games do well. Um, yeah, so okay, so we've talked about, you've talked about balance in games, you've talked, um, where you keep your decisions as being interesting, so there's not obviously one clear path. Now, this is a challenge for, for health professionals, because often they have a treatment which objectively is the best one, right? So how do you then tell people, oh, no, no, you have choices that you can make in the game, but then also know that, yeah, but if you choose rock, you're gonna get sick, right? So in a health game, by providing options, if you know that one is better than the other, right? If you say, you know, the options are vaccinating or not vaccinating, it's your choice. The answer is, no, it shouldn't be. We know that vaccination is better. We just, we just know that, right? It's not that it's balanced, that these are equal choices. It's that there is obviously a one right thing to do for your society. So um, that becomes quite a challenge in the health domain, not so much in, in other areas, but in the health domain, really a problem is unbalanced choices, right? That often the choices do not have realistic balance. They are a good choice versus a bad choice. Then you have to start looking, well, okay, you know, should I have a drink? Um, it's going to destroy my liver, but maybe I've already got cancer and I've only got two years to live anyway, so it doesn't matter if I destroy my liver, so maybe I should take more drugs. Um, maybe you have to create like other balances so that your, your patients still have choices. Um, currency, earning and spending things. So uh, in, in the health area, um, I suppose one of the classic examples of this is things like Weight Watchers, where you have calories to spend. And so basically your calorie, your currency, the game that you're playing is how much I can eat today. Right? So you have these calories that you can spend and you gain, like every day you get a certain number of calories that you earn for the day and then you can spend them buying different food to eat. Right? And so the whole Weight Watchers um, approach to losing weight is a gamification currency-based approach. It is all about my calories are my current currency. And games do that great. Points, of course, earning points, um, in, in, again, in weight loss, people read their scales as their points and they're trying to minimize it like golf. You're trying to get the lowest score. Um, and then people say, well, that's ridiculous because people are different heights. And so they change the score from, from weight to BMI, and you've probably all heard of BMI, and lots of people use that as their points. And basically you're trying to get as few points as possible. Um, it's, it's just a number, right? But, uh, and you know, in general, it's a reasonable indicator, but for some people it's a terrible indicator because it doesn't take into account 
a whole bunch of other factors. Um, specifically, I remember my my stepfather. Um, he big, tall, six foot um, three guy, um, and he was generally a big guy and, and overweight. Uh, and then he got cancer and and um, in, in the pelvis, and they had to remove his left leg and his left hip. Um, and so after removing his left leg and his left hip, he was the ideal weight for his height. Um, he was still overweight and he was still a big guy, but you know, having lost a leg, he was now correct BMI. So he'd got the right number of points, just not the way they intended. So points is a thing that games do really, really well. Honestly, quite easy to motivate men with points, but in the healthcare environment, you have to be really careful when you turn particular things into a number and then let people kind of optimize that number. Um, so reward structures, um, of course, we are um, going through that at the moment in the EU. Um, I see um, uh, Ubisoft just caved to the European Union and decided they would no longer sell loot boxes. Um, in some of their games so so yeah there is there like the whole loot boxes discussion is is basically around games and how variable reward structures are very very motivating for for humans um and and if you get the reward structure just right you can actually manipulate people very easily um in fact a bunch of game designers think this is almost cheating it's a it's a um it's a skinner box approach to to engaging people and addicting them to your to your content so um there's some there's a reason why a controversy in the games environment around reward structures but we're pretty good at that and often you'll find that that people who just need to drive a particular behavior for a short length of time can use re these reward structures and and like press a button get a get a reward press a button get a reward Press a button, don't get a reward. Press a button, don't get a reward. Press a button, get a reward. Like variable rewards, and then occasionally a really big reward, basically like one arm bandits, to drive health behavior. But that's only for short periods of time, right? Because people get hit, hooked into the system, that the reward system, rather than the behavior that you want. And one of the other things games do quite well is status. Um, it's very interesting watching status happen in um, the health system because you have certain conditions. So certainly in childhood, um, getting a diagnosis of a disease changes your status and suddenly a whole bunch of healthcare um, kicks in when you change status. So if you don't have a diagnosis of say ADHD or autism, then you don't get government support. But as soon as you get that diagnosis, as soon as you change status, suddenly you get a massive amount of additional resources and and so the system changes significantly once you've changed status. And so in fact, in the health system, status is even more important. And the health system is completely full of status levels, um, particularly around like level of care, um, the primary, tertiary, sec primary, secondary, tertiary um, care, uh, what level of cancer you have, what level of diagnosis, what level of treatment. Um, so many levels and status information. So, as as I'm sure Christopher has said, and I will reiterate, these are all just tools. They're they can be used well or they can be used badly. The example I have here, and if I can point in YouTube to the right place, I don't know if I'm even doing that nearly right, I'll just check. If I point like that, is that the right place to point to? Um, it's hard to see. No, I think I have to point over there. Yes, no, I have to point there to point at those images. Right, so um, <laughs> those two images, um, those two images. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, those two images. So the two images up there, um, they are, one's the Colosseum and one's a um, Soviet era um, concrete apartment building. Now, one of those is amazing and beautiful 
and one is is very functional and useful but not pretty um and the thing is that it's the same materials right they've used the same concepts and the same tools and the same basic approach of making a building but they've come up with very different results and so games aren't just about um have you used engagement have you used balance have you got a currency have have you ticked boxes on the features that you have um they're much more than the points badge and the leaderboards um as i said i, I don't know if you've shown them my my um quick sprout um if you took brussels sprouts and you said look quick lunch that's fantastic what we need is quick sprout so what we'll do is we'll get a crispy biscuit center and we'll wrap Brussels sprouts around it. And then people will love Brussels sprouts because, you know, quick lunch sounds great at Easter. So we'll say lots of Brussels sprouts at Easter. Um, I, I don't think you would because I think there's something quite important about chocolate as well. So, so when people use gamification or they use parts of games to try and change health behaviors or work in a health system, um, sometimes what they'll do is they'll, they'll, they'll look at the form without really understanding why it's such an engaging and, and enjoyable activity. They'll make something that looks a bit like that enjoyable activity but has none of the chocolate. Right? Um, now there is also a phrase of chocolate covered broccoli which we use in, in the game industry which is where you take broccoli, you pour the chocolate on it and you make something yummy. Um, Actually, cooked broccoli and chocolate's not that bad. So, so I'm not sure that that's such a uh, <laughs> a good example of, of a bad combination. But um, the idea of just following the form without understanding the reason why people en enjoy it. Now, um, the reason I have the image down here is that, in fact, I have found there are green Kit Kats. Um, they are Korean green tea Kit Kats, um, and they're white chocolate with green tea. Uh, I've tried some, they're um, interesting in the flavor. Um, so yeah, so, so that incorrect focus. Now, all of serious games, and particularly in healthcare, is not about necessarily the technology, it's about understanding people, right? Because when we're talking about healthcare, when we're talking about health interventions, we've got to understand the, the behavior that we're trying to affect. We've got to understand the motivations behind it. We've got to understand that you know there's going to be some fatigue in 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 both the player and in potential too much too much too many choices or too few choices or or what is the underlying problem the person has in achieving what they want to achieve. Now, one of the nice things about doing games for health and games for education is that the person you're trying to benefit is the person playing the game. There's a whole other category of serious games which we'll talk about later. Um, in other lectures, around propaganda or games for work, where the person or the group that benefits from you playing the game isn't you, it's someone else, right? And so that's that leads to very interesting ethical dilemmas around how addictive you should make a game, right? Because if you're, if you're helping the player, you're generally okay. So understanding emotions and novelty and, and the Hawthorne effect and the Milgram effect and understanding, like, when we intervene with people, we are making changes, right? And if we tell people to do stuff, they will do it even if they don't want to. So um, there are the white coat effects that, that people have by when an authority tells you to do something, they'll do it until the authority goes away and then they'll stop doing it. So, so understanding that this is not a simple system is very important. Um, and given we're changing health behaviors, understanding behavioral change theory and theories around i i'm i generally use a self-determination theory uh it seems to fit quite well with a lot of behaviors that can be affected by games um but there's also other theories so this um, and we we don't really have a single unifying theory that describes all human behavior so theories of reasoned actions or self-efficacy or planned behavior provide different ways of thinking about why people change their behavior and sometimes those will will work better for a group than another theory so this is sometimes you have to kind of work out which theory best fits what you're trying to achieve uh, and and try and build on those theories um, the the fog model is um, used quite extensively 
so that's where behavior is is um motivation um ability and a trigger that makes you do something mat um which in in norwegian is food so that's nice so be mat mutt um but uh yeah so motivation uh, ability and and a trigger so we often think of those and that's that's very true of smoking cessation um some of i don't know if any of you are smokers but norwegians a reasonable number of smokers um and you've got to combine those three to get people to stop smoking you've got to work out like can you change their motivation to smoke and given it's addictive uh it's really hard to to make them motivated to not smoke um you can try and change their their um ability to smoke and some smokers do that you you make it really expensive so they don't have the ability to smoke and you take away the cigarettes from environments and you say well you're not legally allowed to smoke here and you're not allowed to smoke here and you have to go outside and you're not allowed to smoke in your car and so you make the ability <coughs> harder and then you also have a trigger now triggers are what some people do is they'll they won't go drinking with their friends because they know every time they go drinking that triggers them to have a cigarette so they try and remove one of those behavioral aspects so so as we're doing health behaviors these are some of the things we think about in terms of the theory behind um, the research that you'll be reading about um, uh, games for health now when we go into that um, all of this research and, and I, I'm constantly annoyed by research which measures averages and measures averages of whole populations and go well okay this didn't shift the the population needle very far therefore it's not effective um, and this is the the challenge that there, there isn't really one true flavor of ice cream for example right so normally when I'm in the class I would ask how many of you are strawberry strawberry um, eaters and how many are chocolate eaters um, and you know chocolate usually wins but there are some people who prefer strawberry ice cream to chocolate ice cream um, and Malcolm um, Gladwell has a really nice TED talk on on no true spaghetti sauce right so if you go and watch that you can see his discussion on why there isn't just one correct way of doing things and so any game you make any health intervention will work for some of the population but certainly not all of it um right, and most of those indeed that's good okay so um you've done Bartle's player types so there are multiple player types just saying you know he started off with four he then created it out to eight basically saying there are um uh, there are many many different player types okay so I then go on to talk about engaging game mechanics when we actually go beyond like the 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 ways in which you do things but we look at, at the why of which you do things so hopefully Christopher's talked about agency and control this is part of the self-determination theory system um, but it's the fact that in games you get to make choice now for health games where this matters the most is that if you're working in games for health there is almost nobody who ends up with a medical condition because they chose to have that problem right? basically almost everybody you're dealing with has lost agency they've lost a choice right they've they've um, they've come down with an illness, they've come down with a condition, they've broken an arm, they've, they've, they've lost, lost an arm, they've had cancer, cancer, cancer they're, they're being rehabilitated. Um, whatever has happened, it's usually not their choice that has led them to that. And now suddenly, all the choices, a lot of the choices they had about their life has been massively restricted down to very, very few choices. Uh, and so this is one of the, 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 the big losses that when, when you start, when you enter the health system, is that agency is a problem. Right, people have lost control and so games are actually a great way of returning some of that sense of agency that they have choice so if you can make a good game around health you are attacking one of the big emotional challenges of being sick is agency um, challenge feedback again with health things this is something I saw when I was dealing with public health issues was 
one of the hard things about not eating um, with the hard basics, okay, so you've, you've done all this, but I'm not doing the, um, the uh, oh. We have a bit of an echo, if, um, an echo effect settling in, okay. I wonder if I turn this one to silent, um, if, if I, I turn, turn off that microphone, um, and, and we, we just, just go through the YouTube microphone, would that be better? I'll, I'll, I'll try that and we'll see how it goes. Um, I'll just turn, I can't hear anything through my end, so I don't, I'm, I, I don't believe I'm getting a reverberating echo myself, but we'll see how. We'll see if that, that can, can go any better. Um, okay, so, one of the big challenges of, of losing weight um, is that the feedback on making good eating choices is so slow, right? I mean, you've got that block of chocolate and you think, oh, that'd be nice. But you think, no, no, I shouldn't eat it because in five or six weeks, my weight will be a bit higher than it should be. And then you think, oh, but I'd really nice now. Or you, or you go, go I, I, I just, just oh, I, have I have one more beer, right? And the beer, immediate feedback, great. Long-term feedback, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm now overweight, I've got a beer belly. Um, but the time it takes you to discover that your body no longer can burn through all that chocolate is, um, is still so long that you don't get that immediate feedback. And that's really what you need, is you need immediate feedback to keep you motivated to see that you're accomplishing what you did. Now, one of the interesting um, games for health they did, one of the exa examples they used was running on a treadmill. Uh, and this was, I think, at Stanford University. Um, oh, Echo is gone. Oh, we'll keep, we'll keep it like this and we'll see how we go. Okay, so if we, if you're running on a treadmill, what they did is they did two conditions in virtual reality. One is you saw a mirror in front of you that was an accurate depiction of yourself, right? So they did videotaping of you and, and they just showed you you as you ran on the treadmill. Um, the second condition is they took uh, pictures of you, they did a 3D model of you, and then they made the model, when you first went in, they made it a bit fatter than you actually are. And then as you ran on the treadmill, they visually made the model get slimmer as you ran for, for the 20 minutes, right? So over 20 minutes, it thinned the model. And then they measured how much exercise people did in the weeks following the VR session. And the people who physically, who saw their body getting slimmer in VR while they were doing the, the running had, I think it was like a 70% increase in the amount of exercise they did. So it was a significant and measurable increase in the amount of exercise you did over the subsequent weeks. Even though the only thing they changed was whether or not your, your visual model in the mirror in front of you made you look thinner. So the idea was that that instant feedback, that instant game feedback was able to change the way people perceived exercise because they saw it as more effective. Right? So that's using a game concept of instant feedback to try and change an attitude towards a health condition, which normally has terribly, terribly bad feedback and over a very long cut. Crafting creativity, lots of good stuff. Um, in, in the health area, giving people options to modify stuff. Um, so in a, in a hospital in Barcelona I went to, they had a kids hospital, um, they allowed the kids to, to create cardboard sh and skins for their um, IV stands, right? So you get the IV stand that you walk around with. And they were able to, to build cardboard kind of monsters and creatures and, and turn them into something interesting, right? Um, and so, you know, they, they had clean cardboard that they had from, from medical equipment. So it was, it was, you know, safe. So they were able to turn and do this, this creativity uh, and that ability to edit and craft and customize things. Again, a game concept going into the health arena. Um, and experimentation. Health is one of the few areas you don't do this bit of games much, right? Um, 
So you can do it a bit if you've got a sim game where you allow people to see what would happen if I gave this person lots of drugs. Uh, what happens when you have vodka as your breakfast instead of, of a cup of coffee? Um, you have a bottle of vodka. Um, so you can experiment a little bit in a sim environment, um, but you don't really want nurses to be experimenting with how many drugs they give you. Um, I was listening to a story tonight um, from my mother who was just passing through and she said my my grandfather used to sell um, pharmaceuticals he was a pharmaceutical rep uh, and apparently uh, in the 60s when he was doing this uh, every time that they brought out a new pill he would try one just to see what it did to him just of every pill he sold he would just try one and see what it was like um, which is a bit crazy so apparently self-experimentation runs in my family um, but I wouldn't recommend that for any of you out there. Um, it's extremely dangerous. So, um, but yeah, so so experimentation in healthcare tends to be less useful. Um, but you know, it's it's a, it's a nice game feature, just not so much for health. Social interaction, again, one of the areas where in the healthcare system they're actually getting much better at this than they used to be. Finding communities of people who have the same condition as you have. Right? So the idea is that you link people with cancer together and you form mentoring relationships. You you get people who understand what you're going through, understand the problems you're having and form those communities. Right? And for some people, that's extremely powerful. And games al allow you to also form secondary communities around uh, a condition. Right. So you're so you're all playing a game about this thing. And um, in fact, I've seen a few really interesting ones around the social interaction, um, or particularly in board games. Now, I know most of you are thinking about computer games, but um, so one of the PhD students a couple of years ago, she was looking at, at board games and she was doing board games for, for kidney dialysis. And one of the interesting things was getting people to play the board game and it's not the game that is the thing that changes people's attitudes or changes their behavior it's that while you're playing the game it it brings up topics and questions which you then talk about with your family that you're playing the game with right so so the game becomes the kind of conversation starter right? to to discuss what's going on and the choices that you have, right? So you can imagine a board game where you, you're rolling the dice and you've got a choice of going left or right, you've got a choice of where you do and, oh, well, should, I, should I do this thing with this thing in the game? Um, now, each of those choices is something to do with your condition and you can then talk about them, right? Because it's often very hard to start those conversations. And so by abstracting it into a game, you then allow you, you then break some of the ice you allow people to talk about the game without it just being a direct confrontation and instead of me trying to t like imagine you had a condition and we start telling you how to behave right then some people get very defensive um whereas if we are playing the game together we can discuss the choices of the character in the game or the piece on the board we can discuss the choices that piece is making which isn't necessarily you at the moment, but it might be you in the future. Um, but we're not telling you what to do. We're discussing the choices on the on, in the game. Right? And that's a very different discussion, particularly around sensitive things around health, where a direct confrontation can often have people shut down or, or cut you off or, or not want you to visit them um, because you're you're telling them what to do, just like all the doctors are doing all the time. Right? So, so the social interactions can really be facilitated by by board game okay so um i don't know how much of the game technology stuff some of you might uh i actually i don't think um i was still talking to marish i don't think i'm gonna marius peterson uh i don't think we're doing the game technology course next semester uh unless you guys kind of storm his office and tell him that you have to do it um but i thought i'd just kind of talk a little bit about some of the game technologies in in, in healthcare that are being combined right so um one of the interesting areas is where you start getting games around smart objects um okay yeah, haven't talked about the technology much right so um 
One of the things with healthcare is because you're monitoring a person, you're starting to look at what are the physical interfaces that that person has to the game, right? So rather than just the, the joystick as being a, oh, what kind of UI is it? You're now starting to think, okay, if we give people a balance board, can we train balance and, and a, a physical fitness around balance while they're distracted and playing a game? Right? So the idea is that the interface becomes part of the objective of the game, where the game itself can just be any old thing, right? So it doesn't the game doesn't matter as much as the interface, right? So this is so so here, rather than doing game design in the classic way of thinking about the the player actions and the player mechanics and, and what things look like and, and what effect the cognitive aspect of the game has. We're now just looking at the, the pure interface. And so here you see the balance board. We've also got a, a toothbrush game. And yes, you can go out and buy a toothbrush game where brushing your teeth is is how you make the game move forward. Now, um, by turning the interface of the game into what helps the healthy activity, um, I don't really have to design a game that's that's going to change my attitudes towards brushing my teeth. I just make a game that the only way to play it is by brushing, brushing your teeth. So it just kind of, in playing the game, you achieve the physical result, not through the game design, but through the physical UI. Now, um, those are just a couple examples. Of course, we then move into the fact that we can do 3D printed electronics and you can build all of this stuff, right? Any any interface to any part of the body that you think is going to be interesting, uh, we can start now printing some of these kind of odd devices you put on your forearms or put on your head or put on your legs. So um, attaching things to the body is not hard and sensors have come down so much in cost that we're starting to do some really interesting things with them. Um, and that's where you start doing head tracking with cameras or you have the EMG, so you're putting on electrodes on the skin to measure muscles. You can measure galvanic skin response, so the amount of sweat. Um, there are the AI systems with these kind of cameras that will read emotions. So, so understanding the player and, and responding to the player has become easier and easier. And once we start talking about the health of the player, being able to register their behavior and get that as input and then make a game where if you do the exercise in the right way or or we measure your stress levels and if you're, the game helps you lower your stress levels then that lowers your blood pressure and so we can measure those physiological responses to the game and that's the health thing that we're achieving right so so it's it requires you to think more broadly of what you're doing with your game rather than just focus on on all of those mechanics and, and 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 you know does it have balance choices and does it have points and what are those currency it's no no what is the interface what is the body doing and and how is the body responding um we're certainly also um starting to do more and more eye tracking so some of you would have seen that that we've got got eye trackers for the vives now uh we're getting the pimax coming in which will have eye trackers eventually um and the benefit of eye tracking is you can to see where people are paying attention. Attention is critical for understanding what people are, are doing when they're when they're responding. And this is the, I think we're getting the A glass system. So these are these are ones that hopefully will are are, are already there. Um, I know that um, Richard and uh, Andreas were both looking at these. So Richard had some of the, some of these eye tracking stuff. Um, we have interesting things like the AR sandbox um, downstairs, which um, we're looking at visualizing 3D models and you can make games around physical interactions with things and, and, and f like that, that more tangible interfaces, right? So rather than thinking of just keyboard and mouse and that's my game, games for health, actually look at how other ways you attach. Now, the ultimate in attaching, I think, and, and one of the things that I'm, um, oh, sorry, before I get there, um, augmented reality, also um, something that we've had students um, looking at and as a way of connecting the real world with the um, digital world. And so one of the games for health we worked on was, was around using blocks as a cognitive health game. And that was partly because the physical action of moving the blocks was actually part of the game. So it's that 
moving beyond just oh it's a matching letters game or matching characters game or or finding numbers it is the physical actions that you're doing that result in the health outcome the ultimate connection and um elon musk is currently working on this and i don't know if any of you have have followed any of this um these stories but uh neurolace is the the one that elon musk's um, company has been working on uh and that's where they'll drill a hole in your skull inject a sheath an unfolding mesh which comes into your skull from the back and then unwraps over the surface of your brain so that you your signals can go directly from your brain into the computer um elon musk believes this is the only way that humans can remain relevant because our big sausage fingers are too slow right they're trying to get what's happening in here through this stupid interface into a keyboard is a terrible way of communicating so if we're going to try and keep up with computers we have to have direct interfaces and so so that's a direct out from our brain into the computer once we can do that a bunch of interesting health stuff comes around one is we stop moving right because we don't even have to get up and move around because we've got the connection to the internet all our requests are being sent directly um this is terrifying from a from a um an activity point of view but really interesting from a from a gaming point of view and from games for health we're now reading directly from your brain what your interests and motivations are right so we we're able to see a lot more detail about what you're what you're thinking uh and also you know therefore what works to change your behavior um so i think what i'll do is i'll give you guys a 10 minute break um because we're now at on the hour and now i'm going to dig so so i've kind of gone through hopefully you can see i've been relating healthcare issues to each of those game foundations that you've been thinking of and now we're going to dig into areas of of games for health uh and where it fits in the serious games kind of genres and we're going to go in and i'm going to start talking about specific examples of games for health and and kind of how they've been successful and how they've been measured okay so can we shall we take a 10 minute break or do pe like people want to keep going it's up to you christopher tell me what you think sounds good okay 10 minute break um and um i'll go get myself a coffee you guys go get yourself a drink or walk around or or whatever you need to do get up stand up um and i'll be back in um 10 minutes now can i pull i i i think i can pause the stream rather than actually stop the stream but i think i have to do that on youtube can i pause it where's the pause button i don't usually pause streams i just leave them running in the background um now nah, i'll just leave it running in the background and go get my coffee okay so i'll be back shortly
So I can see Gail is here um, on the Discord. So, so if, if you, you have, have any questions, questions jump on the Discord and, and type, type things, things at me if you have any questions. questions. Got a couple of minutes before I start back up. I have grapes. That's my my bad choice <laughs> for health. This is not as bad as chocolate biscuits. Right, okay, so um, I will start back up. It appears we're all back. Yay, we're ready to go again. Okay, so. Um, oh, okay, my. Oh, it's just me being stationary. Right, okay, so. Games for health, where they fit. So, so um, this is a, a, a general picture of, of the areas of games that, that I had thought about, which are games for science, games for health, games for. 
for production where you make something in the game um, that is useful as a product um, advert gaming where they're trying to sell you something games as work where you do the job and and that is your job is to play a game um, propaganda games where you're trying to convince people of some extraneous fact or or change their opinion um, games for training where the company benefits from you playing the game educational games and social change games and the Olympics is a game for social change right if you look at the Olympic Charter it's all about being an Olympian right so games for health sit sort of in this category now if you look at sort of three big categories uh, and I'm gonna dig further into each of these but um, one of the things we looked at was to break it down into kind of are you dealing with physical health mental health or social health uh, and if you look at physical health um, then actually depression is, is should be on the the mental side so I've got that one needs to move over there but um, so physical the certainly um, remission which was this this one um, here the cancer one um, remission was made many many years ago and it was around cancer and having kids fight cancer um, so Sparks which is a game developed here in New Zealand and I'm now working with one of the developers from that one of the, the academics um, was a game around mental health right? so if you have a look at things like the Wii Fit um, there are um, games here where, where you do uh, intensive rehabilitation games we had the smart cuba games which were around um, trying to look at dementia um, and were a cognitive physical overlap because the cognitive aspects were related to can you perform the task and how well you perform the task with the blocks and the physical um, and so that was the cognitive and the physical was are you able to manipulate the blocks and put them close together and, and actually physically interact with the system right so it had both a physical and a mental component um, and if we look more broadly um, we've got this this idea of mental physical and social now um, another way of looking at this was breaking it down into the types of games for health that are out there okay so um, this is a, a, a categorization of, of games for health that was done by um, uh, ben Sawyer in the Games for Health um, area and, and he was trying to break it down uh, into the kinds of games that are being made and who they're being made for right because health is not just the patient who has a condition right so that's in this diagram here the patient who has the condition is just in that person what are, what are you personally doing there's also professional practice so um, what are you doing like uh, as uh, to train doctors or to train practitioners or, or dermatologists or whatever who who are professional health workers can use games to train them can you do games and, and research and so you guys did um, uh, fold it right which is a research game um, iWire is an is a neuroscience game right it's a game for health because it actually looks at the health of a retina right and so it's in the medical area but it's not a particular person who's going to benefit from it it's research that benefits and then we have public health right so we've got personal professional research academia and and public and then down the other axis we have um, different types of intervention right so who you are intervening with is it a person is it the medical practitioner is it research or is it general public right and then what are you trying to achieve are you trying to prevent something from happening are you trying to treat something that has happened so prevent it from happening if it happens treat it um are you trying to assess people saying okay well um we're we're not trying to treat them and we're not trying to prevent it so we're just going to see has it happened right uh, are you trying to educate people or are you just trying to to give people general informatics you're trying to give them information so if we have a look at the personal side uh in this breakdown it had physical and mental now 
I believe we also need to look at social health. Now, some researchers will put that under mental, right? They say men social health is just mental health, right? And the social aspect of mental health is important, but you could, but we were looking at, at there is actually a separate area from general mental health where you can have, are you socially healthy? Uh, do you have good networks around you? Because you could currently be very mentally well, right? You could have good mental health right, and good physical health. But if you do not have a support network, if anything goes wrong, then you are fragile, right? Because you don't have a social structure to support you, right? So, so it's so that's not just are you mentally well now? It is what structures you have around you. What are your social interactions? And so games can help in that sort of social health area. Um, and there's there's lots to discuss there. And and certainly one of one of my collaborators, uh, Brynja Landmark. Um, he was a doctor who worked on um, geriatric sex, right? So the sex that your grandparents have in retirement homes, um, because sex is very, very important for a lot of people, and it's very important for people who are in rest homes. Um, but most of us aren't willing to talk about it. And that's not just about mental or physical health, it's actually around social health and social interactions. Uh, and so I know it may make some of you squeamish um, to talk about geriatric sex, but it, it's, it's there, it's happening, it's something that um, is very important for an aging population to deal with, right? So not to be squeamish and not to, to avoid talking about things just because you don't feel comfortable. So, so when we talk about personal, I would also add social, but there aren't many games in social health, so so we don't, although I think there should be more, that's currently not a big category, so there's not a lot to put there. So physical health, if you look at, at physical health games, you have Wii Fit, um, there, was a, uh, there are various dancing games where you, you have games around dancing, particularly with mobile phones now, they do activity track, and so the idea is that by doing an activity like dancing, you're able to make a game around it so people can measure and track and see their performance improving. Um, and you know, you have game shows now, which is, you know, talent and dance sh shows. Um, these kind of Fitbits and, and, and activity trackers, those games um, are all trying to turn something that should be just a standard healthy activity for a person to do into a game. Um, now, the the high risk that you have with these, and any time you turn an intrinsically good thing, like fitness, personal health, into a game, you risk damaging the intrinsic motivator by placing an extrinsic motivator over the top, right? So this is one of the, the, the constant challenges we have in Games for Health, is that if we make the games too good, and people start focusing on the game, when the game ends, their health deteriorates, right? And that would be a negative result. So you have to be extremely careful when you're making a game for health. So for example, um, we're currently working on a game for mental health for teenagers. Um, the challenge is if we make a, a game that engages them and, and, and um, they start doing things to achieve in the game, um, if the game stops, do they become suicidal? And does the dip after playing the game get them far enough down that they then kill, kill themselves? Because if they do that, then the game has had terribly negative consequences. Because if you just stayed low but didn't get below the, the, the threshold, then you're depressed, but you're not you're not committing suicide. But if you come up and then go down through, if you go through this level and become suicidal and commit suicide, we can't get you back. Right? So it's it's a dangerous game when you start playing with people's mental health or playing with their physical health. So so personal things, these are although what you'll find is the red line I have at the bottom of the screen here are all of these games, well, almost all of them 
talk about wellness rather than health. In the US, if you use the word health anywhere in your product, you need FDA approval. So you will find in the US that they make no health claims. It's all well-being and happy lifestyle, right? So they're so they're very very careful. And there's this reg leg regulatory red line that you that if you cross over, you're going to have problems in the games for health area. And that one is once you move in, and there are games where you move into actually rehabilitating people, right? So. If you say that you are trying to treat people or you're trying to diagnose people, right, then you have problems, okay? If you're trying to diagnose people, you're trying to say, okay, you have this illness. Doctors get really, really stressed about the idea of a game being used to diagnose people, particularly automatically. Because once you have a diagnosis, as I said earlier with the status information, once you get a diagnosis, you suddenly get medical treatments, you get medical interventions, and you get potentially harmful things happening to you because they believe you have a condition. Now, if that original diagnosis is wrong, everything they then do to you has been wrong. Right? So there's very tight restrictions in health around games that diagnose particular things. So when we were looking at dementia, um, we would not be diagnosing dementia. This is just off the table. You do not diagnose dementia. You screen for it. You say, oh, something's changed. You should see a doctor. Right? But you don't say, oh, we think you have dementia. Right? These two, you like they, they might sound equivalent in the sense of you should see a doctor because we think something's happened cognitively. And we think you might be getting dementia, so you should get to see a doctor. The second one is a diagnosis, the first one is a screen, right? So um, if you are looking, looking at going to Games for Health, immediately you need a, a, a professional doctor involved and you need to start looking at the medical ethics around the game you're doing, right? Because this suddenly becomes very serious uh, when you start encouraging people to do stuff. Now, um, one of the the cycling games, um, one of the cycling um, GPS games, and I forget which one it was now, but um, it was a you know cycling challenge. You try and cycle as fast as you can, uh, and the company got sued because a cyclist sped through traffic and got killed because they ran a red light because they were trying to achieve a shorter time on that particular mission, right? And because the game was motivating that risky behavior, the family sued the game developers, right? Now, if you make a game for, let's say, as the bottom corner here, we have an elderly person, right? Now, one of the risks for elderly people is falling over. And so, um, if you make a game that encourages them to train their balance by putting them in a, in a, a balance situation where they have to balance or they fall over, and they fall over, you could break their hip. And they wouldn't have broken the hip if they weren't playing your stupid game, right? So you cannot just wander blindly into this area and say, oh, you make a game for house, we've got lots of health buffering, we'll make a game to solve it. It's the, oh my, you better know what you're doing. Um, so for example, we had a couple of years ago, we had a, um, a student who was working with epilepsy, right? Um, and we're looking at, at mobile phones and, um, it was a phone app for, for people who suffer from epilepsy because one of the things that it did was when you have epilepsy, some epi um, people with epilepsy, so only like 20 or 30%, have an aura. They know when they're about to suffer a seizure. Um, and so, but they don't, it's not 100%, right? So it's like 20, 30% chance that they'll have a seizure when they get the weird feeling. So they get a weird feeling, sometimes it goes away, sometimes it leads to a seizure. So what you can do is you could have on your phone something that is a, a you know, um, I'm, I'm worried if I don't respond in five minutes, call my um, emergency contact, right? So you turn that on. And then if it asks you in five minutes, are you still okay? And if you say, yeah, I'm fine, but ask me again in five minutes, or you say, no, no, everything's fine now, right? So it has these kind of, it has a kind of a, a checking up on you every couple of minutes. 
And if you then don't respond, it then alerts your emergency contact and they can say, well, the person's having a seizure, so I'll work out their GPS location from the, the phone and then I can go and find them. Hmm. Now, the risk we faced with that was this would, part of the use case is it will use this to go out into the real world. So when I'm feeling a bit weird, rather than just staying at home, I could go out and say, hey, I feel more in, in, in enabled now because if I fall over, someone will come get me. If your app runs out of battery or your app fails or crashes and someone has taken a risk with their life because they believe that your app will save them and your app fails, that person is now dead because of your choice, right? Or that, that they, they used your app. In a game for health, if and you see this when people do exercise, they you consult your doctor. The fact that you're working in the health area means everyone you're working with probably has a doctor. So they should all be consulting their doctor. Now your the doctor doesn't know what your game does. So your doctor the doctor can't give them good advice, right? And that's the problem. So you have you again, any time you're dealing with people's health, you have to be very, very careful around how you motivate people. Um, now an area that isn't so controversial, nice to get away from the diagnosis and treatment. Um, games have been being used very effectively and we've, we've got a, a research project here, um, which I'm meeting with the lady on Friday, um, to create VR games during child labor. So, so uh, when women are about to give birth, um, there's usually a reasonable amount of period of time where they're in a reasonable amount of pain. And either you give them drugs, which aren't great for the baby, or you try and give them fewer drugs, or they, or they just try and bear the pain. Right? This is this is this is not a happy time. Um, so the idea is, can you distract people in pain? Uh, now, childbirth is one particular kind of pain, um, but um, you know, people getting um, going through. Um, burned, if they're in the burns unit and they're having their, their dressings replaced, um, this is incredibly painful because the, you've, you know, your skin's been burnt off. So, so, this, so the amount of drugs required so you don't feel pain is actually bad for you. And, and so, so they, they want, want to give you as few drugs, drugs as possible, but they, they need some way of distracting you. And, and so, so games, because you get, get that flow state, state that you've talked about with the chicks in the Harley, um, oh, she's in your Harley, um, that flow state that have been massively involved in the game can be used to distract your mind from the massive amount of pain that it's in. Now, because the pain is a short-term thing and the game is a short-term thing, um, the idea is that you're not triggering those long-term how do we change behaviours, how do we make healthy living, how do we have long-term health effects, this is just that, no, I'm in pain now, I need something so I'm not in pain. Right? Uh, and, and so, so this area is, is something that certainly in virtual reality and, and games are used for a lot in hospitals already. And so we, the research is looking at how we use these more effectively. Um, so uh, there's also um, games for for um, mental activity. So these are on the, uh, the if we scale up um, on the the mental health side. Now you would think that these these are just a personal improvement, but They've also been relatively um, controversial. So, um, the, the brain brain age and the um, brain training. Um, Lumosity has gotten into trouble. So, Lumosity is the biggest cognitive health gaming platform. Right now, what Lumosity did is they started their small gaming platform by basically turning cognitive tests into mini games. Right, and then basically the mini game was just the cognitive test, and that's all you did. Um, and then they went around and they bought up all of the other small companies who were doing cognitive training. And oh my god, they, they, they started making crazy claims about their games. Um, saying how you know, it, it, it decreases your, your, um, your brain age and it makes you um, smarter and, and more capable. And, and then the Americans took them to court and said, no, 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 you can't make those medical claims without the evidence. And you don't have the evidence. So Lumosity has had to pay big bills and, and wind back on their advertising because 
there's not a lot of evidence that brain training actually works in gaps, right? Um, certainly not targeted brain training like luminosity. There's reasonable evidence that games like Portal and improve your problem solving, but games specifically designed by health professionals to have an effect tend to be terribly bad games and not, not enjoyable, people don't want to play them, they don't play them outside of the clinical setting, right? So um, the woman I'm working with in, in um, Wellington, she worked on Sparks in the, in, in the game that did a full um, random controlled trial. So that's the standard for medical um, data is a randomly, con a, a randomized controlled trial. Um, so it has a, a treatment group and a control group and, and they randomize who's in what and it's, it's, um, so it's a, um, it's a full proper me medical test. And it was effective, as effective as treatment. The problem is as soon as you take it out of the lab, as soon as you take it away from a, someone working with you on the game and you just put it in the wild, nobody follows through. Right? It, in the wild it doesn't work. In the lab it works. Right? And almost every game you'll read about, every game for health that you'll, you'll, you'll do research on, almost all of them will be great in the lab and never tested outside of it. Right? So we have no idea whether people actually benefit from it. So this is this is the big challenge we have in Games for Health right now, is how do we move beyond the lab? Um, now, another area that's somewhat safer is education and informatics. So so there's there's a game that Brits did, which was a sexual education game, right? And it taught you about um, diseases of, um, sexually transmitted diseases as a fun game because they wanted to tell 14 to 16 year olds about sexually transmitted diseases. So they made a game out of it because at least then they'd play the game and they'd be able to ask things about sexually transmitted diseases. It would start the conversation. Um, you could have games about diabetes and 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 about um sort of how how do you like games that that talk about choices and what foods do what and those sort of things there there are games which allow you to experience things so so there's an autism simulation game where it puts you in the environment that well according to developers and and some of the people that we're working with the kinds of distractions and inability to, to, to focus that you get as um, in some forms of autism. So these sort of um, simulated games. And another safe area is training, right? To some extent training, right? Um, so surgeon simulator is obviously just hubris training. Um, but we have a, um, a, a master's student uh, up in, or a couple of master's students up in Trondheim um, who are looking at using game technology to train surgeons, right? Because we already know that surgeons who play a lot of games are more dexterous and so are better at um, at actually can, um, performing surgeries. Um, and uh, there are various health training games that are being made. So again, safer because you're not trying to directly affect someone's health. You're trying to help educate them about something. Now. If your game has something that's not true and someone acts on that false information, then yes, you can also screw up some the 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 system. Um, we looked at a game that tried to teach you game it um, that tried to teach you about um, side effects, right, and percentages, right, because people are really not not particularly good at understanding health messages, right. Uh, so one of the things that doctors wanted us to do is how do we say when when we say twenty percent or five percent chance, right? Or um, or if we treat these people, some of them would have got better anyway, some of them wouldn't have got better, and some we treat got better because we treated them. Um, how do we show that information so people understand these ratios? Um, so informatics kind of approaches. Now I'll skip that. Um, one of the things that that we will talk about later in the course and 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 also if someone's interested in doing in doing sort of the metrics of of um, computer games um how you measure things becomes really really critical 
because in games for health one of the things you'll find is that the games themselves so when you start reading these games they'll talk about often a six week or a, a generally the longest around a six month follow-up now that's partly because of phd funding running for three years so it kind of takes you two years to build something you test it and then you follow up six months later as your last paper on your phd thesis Right? So six month follow ups are, are generally the latest you'll see and often you won't see any follow up and that's partly one is if there is a follow up it's six months later. Um, the other reason is that they'll do a follow up, you will play the game, you get the games effective, you put it out there, you follow up and you find that the game just doesn't work and you don't publish because that's really disappointing. Right? There's no point in publishing. Uh, oh well, you know that game that we published that we thought was really good. No, no, it's terrible. Nobody should use it. Right? That's actually much harder to motivate yourself to spend the effort to write that paper that says your whole idea that you've spent three years developing is doesn't work and isn't useful. Um, and so you've got to think right now. So, <laughs> so it's much mm. harder. Okay, so as soon as my flash player is installed, the yeah, will probably follow. Oh. Whoop, something's gone wrong. What have we got? I hadn't expected that we need to install that thing in there. Oh, okay. Anyway. Hello. There you go. I've, I've unmuted myself. So, when did you stop listening to me? Sorry again? Uh, did you, did you stop did you hearing me? Stop hearing me? Around 10 minutes ago. Oh, Lord. Okay. Oh, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's oh, not fantastic. Uh, that's not fantastic. Uh, it's a bit of a pity. Well, it is a pity. So okay. okay, so, um, okay, well, I'll, I'll, okay, well, I'll I can kind of skip through some of those, and I was just going to go yeah, through some of the warnings, and then I was going to ask, get you guys to talk to me and, and ask questions. So, um, one of the things for medical treatment, extrinsic rewards. Um, moving motivation to outside of just generally being healthy um, can be very bad, particularly bribing people to do healthy behaviors can backfire massively when the bribe goes away. Okay? So, um, yeah, you've, you've got to be careful about giving points or giving rewards or giving financial incentives. Um, one of the interesting games that I want you guys to look at and I was going to show you is um, in here is Diet Bet. Um, have any of you heard of Diet Bet? So Diet Bet um, is an amazing game where what you do is you bet how much weight you're going to lose. And so you join competitions which allow you to bet a certain amount of money. Uh, and if you lose the weight, you get into the pool of winners. So let's say there are uh, the class of, of five of you um, or ten of you all bet a thousand kroner. Now, with that yeah. thousand credit, it goes into a pool. Right. Diet bet takes the thousand credit out because you know, hey, we've got to make money. Um, and then the rest of you are competing for that nine thousand credit from the ten of you. Um, and whoever says they lose four percent of their uh, body mass, they get to share in that pool of money. So whoever doesn't lose weight. Loses money. loses money. So it's kind of a double win. So One, you didn't lose weight and you lost all your money. Um, it seems very gambling-ish betting, but it's it's very popular. As you see, there's a pot here. Um, so uh, it's a pot of $3,850. There are 110 players and they've each bet, bet $35. Right? And, and so you then get to play, so play the game. Play the game. Right? So that's so a very 
they're a financially focused extrinsic motivator on weight loss. As far as we can tell, this is a perfect way of motivating yo-yo dieting. Just lose weight, gain weight. Paid to lose weight, gain weight. Paid to lose weight, gain weight. It's just it's gonna be terrible. <laughs> but it's a game. It's a gamification of losing weight. It's just potentially a bad gamification of losing weight. Um, oh, you. Oh, uh, can't see if that was updating. Hopefully, uh, have the has the YouTube been updating? Sorry. Has the YouTube been updating? Has the YouTube been updating? Nope. The YouTube is not uh, running. Um, no. Hmm. How about I reload the YouTube? Yeah, talk as well. Okay. Oh, yes. I'm talking on YouTube. So is the YouTube still up? Okay. YouTube broke for some reason. Sorry about that. Okay. I'll mute my Discord and we'll skip over the YouTube. So um, in the top corner here, you can see the the diet bit. Um, I actually went to the website and I, I thought you'd be able to see it, but you didn't. But um, diet bit, you can look that up. It is a terrible terrible way of losing money uh, losing losing money and potentially losing weight um but it's a it, it's a, an interesting game around health that is that is focused on how do we do extrinsic motivators At, in games house you have to worry about your consequences are you making games which decrease people's awareness of the risks that they're taking are you falsely motivating them and eventually are you giving them game of fatigue um, so, um, Pokemon Go, there was this was a, an issue for, right? Because with Pokemon Go, the idea was that, you know, you'd get out there and be social. And so there were a bunch of people who, who went out and, and were out and they're walking and they're going around and they're collecting Pokemon and, and you know, it's great and great and great. And then they got sick of the game and they stopped going out because, you know, or they, they, they left, if they left their phone behind, they wouldn't go for a walk because, ah, oh, the phone's dead, I won't be able to collect any Pokemon, so I just won't go for a walk. Right? Because walking became about collecting Pokemon, right? so this is this is the kind of, of oh I'm tired of the game, so I'm going to stop the physical activity as well. These were side effects and consequences of the game that they didn't think about. Um, one of the challenges in healthcare is again, as I said, people have lost choice. If you turn a medical condition into a fun game, that might not actually sit well. Uh, with all of your players, right? Some things are serious, right? I have cancer. I don't want you to turn my cancer into a game, right? This is not fun for me. This is not a game. This is my life, right? So, so that kind of alienation, driving people away because you're trying to make fun of something that is serious to them, right? So again, um, for Games for Health, you have to watch out around the kinds of games that are being made and and what effect it's gonna have on people. You could make the wrong type of game for individuals, right? And particularly around being too social or too competitive. Um, so uh, so there's some people when they've got a medical condition, they don't wanna share that with anyone. They don't want to be social. They don't want to form a community around um, having gonorrhea or something, right? I know mean, that's just, they just don't wanna know, right? They, it is, they're not gonna play a game because they don't want other people to know that they've got that condition. So, so these are not, so, so games are not, a one size fits all or even the right solution to all problems um, and one of the things you you can kind of see this with some of the medical professional papers that you'll read over the semester is that they are doing games by kind of um, by the numbers right that says oh games have points okay we'll add points games have badges we'll add badges um, games have a leaderboard yep we'll add we've added that um, games have currency yep yep we've, we've added points and currency that's all good so we've, uh, we've made a game Right? And they're not made a game. They've just ticked all the boxes of things that are games, right? Um, and all they've wanted to do is they're medical professionals. They want people to do what they're told. And so they make a game because they think it will be fun for people to do what they're told, right? Without understanding that actually having choice is part of playing the game. And so 
by taking away choices and just adding all the rest of it, you you destroy the actual value and motivation of the game. That there is something that you are voluntarily doing rather than being forced to do. Um, you also got to watch a lot of a lot of uh, and oh so many health games and serious games in general are terrible, terrible games. They are boring. They are obnoxious. They are patronising. They are bad, bad games. Right. Um, so be very critical of the games you read in these papers, particularly the health games, because health professionals tend not to understand giving people choices. And so they tend to be bad at creating engaging games around medical conditions. Okay, so the last things I wanted to say, um, if you can still hear me, um, was if you're going to make games for health, um, think about choices, right? You need to find a way of showing them progress with whatever health condition they have. You need to make it meaningful for the player, particularly related to their, their, their condition. Um, you do need to let them explore a little bit, right? Because if you just tell them, oh, you do this and we fade to black and you just die, right? You, you need to actually show consequences because if they're going to try different things, you need to show them what that will do. Uh, and you need to let people customize things, right? So when you're looking and analyzing games for health, think about how much choice is this giving the player? Does it show them progress, particularly towards if being good in the game helps you with the physical condition that you're trying to get to, right? Now, games for, for pain relief, right? Being good at the game is, is relevant. As long as you're engaged in the game, that's fine, right? So, so um, Again, one size doesn't fit all. But these are sort of some of the things you should be thinking about when analyzing games and thinking about are games effective in in this particular scenario or is this game a good example of game? Because a lot of the researchers, they'll say, oh, this game had this effect, therefore games aren't useful. And that, that's just craziness, right? It's no, no. The game you made isn't good. That's why it didn't work. It's not that games aren't good. It's that your terrible game isn't good, right? So be aware that they'll make those leaps to assuming all games are the same or the 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 <laughs> the dosage rate of a game. So when you take um, paracetamol, for example, right? You'll see on the pack of of um, of Paracet, you'll have five hundred milligrams or two hundred and fifty milligrams or one hundred milligrams, right? That's the amount of the drug. And doctors are really, they're very interested in what is the right amount of dosage, how many milligrams of drug should you get. And I've seen them apply this to games and assume that an hour of gaming is equivalent to a dose. And so they're trying to say, okay, is two hours of gaming better than one hour of gaming? And is four hours of gaming worse than two hours of gaming? Right. So what is the right dosage level of gaming and I said, I think that's that's not how gaming works one hour of gaming might be completely different to a different hour, another unrelated game hour of gaming i can play an hour of, of straight crazy match three on my phone and have that completely different to an hour of chess they're both games but they're really different one is just a, oh, I can't be bothered, I'm just, oh, no, 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 no. and the other is, oh, I'm thinking, I'm focused, I'm concentrated, I'm really engaged, or playing um, a Brand Theft Order or a VR game. Dosage is really a, like a weird way of thinking about gameplay, but in the medical professional professions, dosage is key, and so we have to find a new way of analyzing games. And uh, as you read your games for health stuff, um, you'll unfortunately if you want to be really good at this you need to find a medical professional because um, you cannot learn enough about healthcare and about games to be able to do both well and so it's about knowing enough about games and being able to work with medical professionals okay so i was going to let you guys ask me some questions if you had any questions at all um potentially pop into the discord or write the questions down um we can talk on, on on air or we can just have a discussion in discord it's up to you i've 
Chick, are you still hearing me? Well, on here, we can just have a discussion in this group. It's up to you. Mm -hmm. Questions by everyone, anyone, really. So either type in the Discord or ask it via this microphone here. Sun, do you hear us? Yes. Well, on here, we can just have a discussion in this group. It's up to you. Right, okay, I can't hear you, I'll just you. Either type in this one or ask it via this microphone. Sun, do you hear us? Yeah, we see everything else. Did they see today? Yeah, um... Ah. Okay, I think I have killed it. I think it was because I was getting... Yes! My Discord was getting audio and sending it through OBS, and OBS was then sending it to you. Yes, yeah, yeah I, I can, can hear you now. Always want them, they always leave them wanting more. So I can, I can, I can go back through. So, so we went, so the missing 10 minutes was somewhere around personal and mental health. Does any of this stuff look familiar? You lost me on the next game. Okay, so I, I, was, I was talking about some of the challenges of X gaming, um, particularly around taking risks with people. Um, so there was uh, a bunch of challenges around, you know, if if you're doing X gaming and someone plays your game and, and gets really engaged and they have a heart attack, ah, that's not good, right? Because they're supposed to get medical advice before they do strenuous activities, and so you have to understand where you fit in their their health regime. Uh, I talked about pain distractors. This is generally a much safer area to be in because um, it's pain in the short term, and so you're not having to kind of worry about long term behaviours or extrinsic and intrinsic motivators or or like the other problems with your game. If your game is okay and they engage in it, that's great. If it's not, they'll just ask for more drugs. The drug they would have got anyway. So, um, uh, Lumosity, I talked about uh, mental health training. Uh, and basically the, the, the keynote point from here is that Lumosity has paid the FCC a big fine for false advertising because there's very little evidence that mental games, or games designed to train you mentally actually transfer skills into other areas. So um, unfortunately you can't believe Lumosity and say, if I just play this game every day, I'll become brilliant. Um, it's not how it works. <laughs> um, so unfortunately it'd be nice, but uh, it's, it's not that simple. Um, and uh, the mental health things, or cognitive health, there might be something in doing different games. And so one of the, the games that was effective was Portal. Helped you with your puzzle solving skills. Right? So a good game can help you. Um, and then I talk about uh, sex education. Um, so there's uh, games for uh, educating people about sexually transmitted diseases, uh, and also games who educate about autism or what it's like to have epilepsy. And so these were, were games which aren't trying to change your health, they're trying to change your levels of knowledge, right? So it's in the health domain, but they're not directly games for health. Um, and also games that train you to do things. So Surgeon Simulator is a humorous one. Um, it's not really a Surgeon Simulator, but there are VR games coming through that are training people and you still have to pull them a test at the end. So if the training's not great, it must takes you longer before you can pass the test. But you still pass the test. So you still got a kind of injective measure to show that it's okay. Um, and 
games for more more games around information and and trying to understand recommendations and you know i was talking to a group in in uh south oslo who were making a hand washing game for nurses to try and train them to always wash their hands after they'd dealt with each patient because yeah um it's something you're supposed to do, isn't it? Um, and they're trying to make it a game so people would be more likely to do it. Um, uh, and that's that you can see if they're doing that because you can see how often they wash their hands. So it's the, the game isn't kind of directly affecting a the health of the player. It is training them how to do something better. Um, I skipped over that. And then I talked about how you measure things. And then I think I've, you guys came back to me before I went to the risks. That's the quick. Yes, yes, we have talked a bit about seeing who creates the games and their motivation, money, status, etc. In regards to health games, who are the big developers and investors? Right, okay, so this is the, the one of the one of the big challenges of getting games made in in the in the health area is who pays for them. So in the states, it's insurance companies. Uh, so the idea is that the insurance company um, is charging people, and if you play the game and improve your health, you can get a discount on your insurance. So that's how they're trying to run it in the States. They're, they're going through insurance companies. Um, but then the motivation is for the insurance company to convince people to do things that decrease the cost, but doesn't necessarily increase their health. Yeah, because those are two slightly different things. Um, so basically there's, there's not much involved in how do you kind of make people happier and healthier? It's how you make them less expensive. Uh, now, um, the, the other area, honestly, there are lots and lots of academics and kind-hearted developers and people who want to change the world, nurses and doctors who want to make positive impacts on people's lives. Yeah. So those are often the developers, and they're often doing it not for the money or not necessarily for the status, just because they want to make people's lives better. Um, so you can find a pool of people who want to do that. The challenge is that it's quite expensive. Um, and, you know, we talk about, I, I, I talk about Grand Theft Auto, uh, where it was, um, actually no, it wasn't Grand Theft Auto, it was Call of Duty 4. $50 million to develop. $200 million in advertising. So the thing is that, that developing a game, you might be able to do that, but a clinical trial to show that it's effective is going to be 10, 15, 20 times the cost of making the game. So you'll spend, um, you know, $100,000, a million kroner making a game. And then you'll spend 20 million kroner trying to show that it's effective. Right? And that's the problem currently in Games for Health, is that there's no money to prove the effectiveness of most of these games. Um, and that's where you get this falling over, and that's when you get people who are trying to make money, and then they don't need to prove that it works, they're just trying to scam people out of money, and they lie about the effectiveness because, hey, they're not trying to help you, they're trying to get your money. Mm. Yeah, so no, that is that is the big problem. Um, most of the ones that go through trials are actually, honestly, they're trying to help, but there are still scam artists out there. Um, I, I certainly believe there are. Um, I think the the prospects are partly in countries like New Zealand, which have a, um, a 
an accident, a, a sort of nationalized insurance system where that system understands that it's trying to, to make people healthier and it's publicly funded and they, the government has a measure of well-being and so you can have a, a, a kind of state-sponsored um, focus on well-being and focus on better lifestyles. Um, you could do it in Norway where you have a state-funded health system which can take a holistic view of health and so you can create games that make people's lives better and that can be government funded because the tax take is, is can go to improving quality of life. Um, I also see there's lots of, of potential on the creative end. So one of the things I'm very interested in is, is having patients make games about their choices. So like I was talking about with the board games, if you, if you make a board game about the choices you have, in the condition you have to do re in your whatever your health con condition is you have to do research and you have to understand what your choices are and in that research you learn something and when you play the game with your relatives you'll also start some of those valuable conversations so i think there's a lot of the, those areas that it's useful um i think there is enough open source development around data visualization and data presentation that means you can record your own medical data and that can help. Um, and you know, people people are interested in spending money on, on being healthier. So if, if a game can actually help, then hopefully we can start moving away from some of the, the massive costs of doing randomly controlled trials and start doing kind of systematic anecdotal evidence so it, it's the idea that that people like you benefit from this thing um, rather than a, a random population of people benefit from this thing so it's quite a different way of thinking about about how you measure health effects but no I'm, I'm, I'm positive <laughs> I think currently the the best way is to to stay away from health and stay in well-being for a while um, and basically if you are at a university and you are government funded and you have a large amount of money and you have a hospital involved and you have the national insurer involved then you start looking at health but you don't do it as a small company. You don't do it as a solo PhD or a solo master's person. You do it as part of a long-term large project that has funding and has ethical approval for long periods of time. Unfortunately. <laughs> oh, and it's fascinating it is fascinating it's a it's a marvelous marvelous area i mean, and if someone cracks it there is massive amounts of money to be made and huge amount of positive impact you can make it's just one of these high risk high return things like a game <laughs> okay um I wasn't actually I wasn't currently recording so um, I don't have a separate record other than what YouTube was recording. So when rec YouTube crashed, I, that 10 minutes, I think, just disappeared.
Yes. <laughs> yep. mm. Um, I, I'm I'm very interested in having them ask me questions about things, and they can send me emails. I will I will respond. Um, I'll I'm I'm interested in having chats on Discord um, after lectures and stuff. If if um, I'm I know I should be in Wellington from now on, but I'll I'll be trying to listen in to some of the discussions on Tuesday nights. Um, and so I'm quite keen to just you know be available for the students. Okay, right. Have a have a good afternoon. <laughs> okay, see ya.